what would it take for you to invite someone to our table, to this table? Dancing dishes, catchy tunes, throwing glitter. Russell just said no. Mm, he's not going to allow me to do that. What is it? What is it going to take for you to invite someone to this table? Our scripture today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 15. It takes place at a table. All the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around Jesus to listen to him. The Pharisees and legal experts were grumbling, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus told them this parable. Suppose someone among you had 100 sheep and lost one of them. Wouldn't he leave the other 99 in the pasture and search for the lost one until he finds it? And when he finds it, he's thrilled and places it on his shoulders. When he arrives home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Celebrate with me, because I've found my lost sheep. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who changes both heart and life than over 99 righteous people who have no need to change their hearts and lives. Or what woman, if she owns 10 silver coins and loses one of them, won't light a lamp and sweep the house, searching her home carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Celebrate with me because I've found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, joy breaks out in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who changes both heart and life. In this sermon series, we've talked a lot about family. In fact, the very first sermon that I stood up here and gave you, we talked about the kitchen and the table. It's my favorite place in the whole house. It's where people gather in my house to be together, to talk about the good things and the bad things. And I asked you a question. I said, who is God? Did you think about that? If we went around in a circle today, could you answer that question? Who is God? Week two, we said, okay, we've asked who is God, who are you to God? If we're talking about a family, we've got to know who this God is that we're serving, but you've got to know who you are in the family. Do you know that answer? Do you know who you are to God? Week three, we talked about conflict. If we're a family, that's just inevitable. It happens. Do we shove it in the closet and close the door and hope nobody opens it? Or do we sit down together and work through it? And then last week, we talked about friends that become family. That sometimes what we picture family to be, that perfect picture on the Lego box, when we open it up and dump it out, it's just a whole lot of pieces to put together. And we really need someone to be there with us to do it. So today, we talk about the church as a family. Do you consider this church your family? Do you consider the people sitting in the pews next to you your family? Would you have a conversation with them about who God is? Would you, would you admit those things hiding in your closet, begging to fall out everywhere on the floor? I heard someone say once, you know, preachers know it all. They're the ones who have studied. They're the ones who have stood on a stage. They're the ones who are trained to get up here and tell people about God. That's not my job. I sit, I listen, I learn, I go home. And I mean, come on now. For some reason, preachers all have good stories. My story's just normal. It's just average. It's just an everyday story. Nobody needs to hear that. If I asked you to stand up here today and tell your story, how many of you would jump at the chance? So many hands. 
But here's the deal, friends. Look around. There are a whole lot of empty seats in here. There are signs on those seats that say, this seat is saved. Now, I heard you out there. Why is my seat saved? Can I scoot it over? But the truth of the matter is, the pastor standing up here only talks to the people sitting in this room. Today, Jesus tells a story about a lost sheep and says, if you have a hundred of them and one goes missing, you don't just not look for it. You go after it and you find it. And when you bring it home, you celebrate. The same thing with a lost coin. How many of you have gone looking for that $1 bill that you know you stuck somewhere in your house? And when you find it, that $1 bill feels a whole lot like a $100 bill because you put that much effort into finding that $1 bill. It's the same way with this place, friends. I can talk to all of you about God. Pastor Sarah, Pastor Chris, we can all stand up here and tell you the stories that are contained in that book and tell you our story. But at the end of the day, it is you that takes it beyond these walls. It is you that is tasked with telling God's story to the people that these seats are saved for. My grandfather was a really good storyteller. He also was a member of a very conservative church, an evangelical church, and everywhere we went, we told people about God. I'm not exaggerating. I grew up in Denton, so anybody who knew Yule Tan said, oh, your grandpa told me about Jesus. I have no doubts. To the point where when we were kind of all in the middle school phase where you're too cool for just about anything, we all drew straws to see who got to go to the grocery store with grandpa because you were going to be there for four hours. Whether you bumped into him in the aisle or it was at the checkout, he was going to tell somebody about Jesus. In the days of answering machines, his message said, hey, do you know Jesus? As a 13-year-old girl, I thought it was the worst thing that could ever happen. As a 33-year-old woman in the church, I now have a deep respect for him and his way of saying, I love my church and I love God. Now, here's the thing. We're all good Methodists. We say, you know what? That's for the Baptists. Let them stand on the corner with the Bible. We hear the word evangelism and we picture Tammy Faye Baker with her big old blonde hair and bright blue eyeshadow. That's not us. But here's the thing, friends. That book, that Bible, is full of a whole lot of imperfect people who got to know God and he transformed their life to something greater. Has God transformed your life into something greater? Sometimes that, that seems to mean that something awful has happened to us, and that's the only way that God can work in us. Something so great that it's unbelievable has happened to us, and that's the only way that God can work in us. But friends, God works each and every day. I recently moved and have been unpacking things one at a time, and I found these bracelets. I wear them a lot. They have a variety of charms on them. The first time I ever got this bracelet was from my mom when I gave birth to my oldest son. It has a baby carriage right here. And in the six years since then, I have filled it with memories from all sorts of ages and stages of my life. One of the relationships that's represented on this bracelet is no longer in my life. And as I stared at it, I thought, what do I do? Do I just shove it in the drawer? Pretend it doesn't exist anymore? Maybe I should just take off the charms that remind me of this person because then I won't have to deal with it. But then I think about this passage Jesus didn't leave out the hard stuff. He didn't just set the people that made life easy at his feet. He set the sinners and the taxpayers 
And he told his story of his relationship with God. And I realized that my story, while maybe hard, maybe I don't want to tell it all to you. Maybe I think God had nothing to do with it. My story might match up with yours. And your story might match up with someone who these seats are saved for. It's not just the preacher, friends. It is you when you step out of this place that tells how God is still alive and well. Even if the answer to the story is, I don't even know that God's here. Because it's in those questions, it's in those struggles, it's in all of those fears that we allow God to work in our lives. Today, we watched a clip from Beauty and the Beast. If you're in my house this summer, you either get to watch Moana or Beauty and the Beast. Those are your options. Every TV, all at once. That scene is magical. The plates come to life. The world is laid out for us in golden splendor. But let me tell you a secret. Today you come to a table with as much magic, as much mystery, and as much love as you saw on that TV screen. Today we come together, young, old, happy, sad, we all look different, we all feel different, we all know different. But when we come here to this table, something magical happens because we know that God is present in this meal. You know that regardless of any other day of the week and anything else you're going from, you can come and stand here and know that you're eating with the God that loves you so much. One of the very first parenting classes I taught had a young couple. They had kids that were the age of my kids. They were full of life and love. They were engaged and involved in the church in every way you can imagine. If there was a committee, they headed it up. If there was a chance to be up here doing something great, they were there. They were people that stood out. Surely they know God. Surely God is present with them in their life. They were those type of people. I went on vacation with my family and was sitting on the beach when I got a notification on my email. Now, I wasn't checking email. Not on vacation. The email said that this particular male had passed away. And I thought, what? I mean, he's my age. They have kids my age. Was there a wreck? What, what happened? I picked up the phone and I called them. I called the church and they said, no. He took his own life. And I thought, how does that happen? How does someone who seems so sure of God's role in their life suddenly disappear? But that's the deal, friends. That's why your story is so important because what you see on the outside doesn't mean that's what you're experiencing on the inside. And the more that you share how that relationship with God is making you angry or sad or mad or happy or joyful, the more opportunity you give for others to join that fight with you. Every week I've issued some sort of challenge. Think about who God is. Think about who you are. Clear out your closet a little. This is our last sermon in this series. And this is my challenge to you today. Know that your story is deeply intertwined in the story of God. That you continue the story of the Bible long beyond revelation. That I believe that God is alive and well and working in each of you. And that these open seats aren't a sign that we're not growing. They aren't a sign that we're missing something. They're a sign that it's time to invite someone else to experience this world, to experience God's love and great relationship, and that you are the one to invite. It feels weird. It feels scary. 
But you don't have to run to the corner and say, I love Jesus. You just got to tell people what's happening right now in your life. Because it matters. It matters to God. And it matters to the life of your family in this church. Because they are your family. Amen.